Sometimes, skull scientists want to know how well skulls can bite, and sometimes also how well different skulls bite compared to each other. Traditionally, this has been estimated using linear measurements of leverage, moment arm analysis, beam theory, and others. But here's the thing. Skulls are super complex structures, and it isn't always easy, or particularly accurate, to compare them using simple measurements. And sometimes we want to go deeper and compare how well different skulls do specific biting behaviours, like shaking things or pulling at things. One method we can use for these kinds of questions is called finite element analysis. In this video, I'm going to break down this engineering technique, also known as FEA, and then I'm going to take you through how I construct and solve a finite element model of a skull. Dr. Rex here, welcome to the Scullywag Lab where I break down the bare bones basics of skull science. Today, we're looking at FEA. Now in the past, I've applied this technique to answer questions relating to animal behavior, growth and development, ecology, evolution, and paleontology. Like most research methods, it can be used in both very simple and very complex ways. But the general concept of it is actually pretty easy to understand. And for those interested in understanding the science in research papers, a basic understanding of the general concept is all you really need. So let's get into it. FEA is an engineering tool that uses computer simulations to predict how an object will react to various physical effects in the real world. These physical effects might include heat, vibrations, or fluid flow, and, and most important for skull research, the application of forces. It was first used in aerospace engineering in the development of things like aeroplane wings and other structures. And here's how it works. Any object in the real world has potentially infinite points of reference from which to collect information. But infinity of anything isn't really helpful for computing the transfer of physical effects. One answer to this problem is to break down those infinite points into an actual definable number of points that represent the overall shape and structure of the object. And a way to do this is to construct a representation of the object using small, simple shapes. This was a lot harder to explain 10 years ago, but now with the growing popularity of 3D modeling and digital art, we see these kinds of things all the time. The process of constructing a representation of a complex shape out of small, simple shapes is called discretization, because the object is being changed from infinite shape to discrete shape. And just like in 3D modeling elsewhere, these simple shapes are usually triangles or quads that make up the surface of the object. These shapes are called elements, and elements are connected to each other at points called nodes. And these are typically located at the corners of the shapes, but there can be more of them positioned along the edges if necessary. When we see a bunch of elements all stitched together by nodes, this is called a mesh. But if we want to learn how the entire volume of a 3D structure responds under certain conditions, these elements need to be 3D. This makes a surface mesh into a volume mesh and allows us to gather data from nodes that are all located throughout the inside of the structure as well. For cases like these, triangles and quads can be converted to tetrahedra or cuboids to make up a volume mesh. What we end up with is a structure with infinite points of reference represented by a finite number of elements, hence the name finite element analysis. And the mesh is also called a finite element model. Once we have a finite element model, we can allocate material properties to the elements. These might be properties of steel, wood, bone, enamel, all sorts of things. We can then apply certain conditions to specific nodes of the mesh that are directly involved with the effects being simulated. For example, to simulate a set of applied forces, some nodes need to remain still or be unable to rotate while other nodes will have forces applied to them. The simulation can then be run, and we can solve the model. Solving a model involves generating displacement matrices and solving tons of differential equations, and this can take quite a bit of time if the model has lots of elements. From the solved model, we can extract information from any node or element of interest. This includes reaction forces from the constrained nodes and values of stress or strain from the elements. Stress is the amount of force per unit of area, and strain is the change in length divided by initial length, sometimes also called deformation, basically how much the structure bends. And finally, these stress and strain values can be visualized with heat maps on the mesh surface. And these are really useful for papers and press conferences because they look really cool. All right, now that I've covered the basics of the approach, I'll show you how I do this in a skull. First things first, skulls have a lot of components to them with a lot of internal geometry. 
So it's important to have a means of generating a surface mesh that includes all of this information, or at least as much of it as we can. And we do this using CT scans. CT scanning involves taking lots of high quality x-ray images of the skull and stacking them on top of each other. This creates a 3D stack. We can then set the computer software to leave out anything with low density like air or soft tissues. And this leaves us with the skull, which can then be exported as a surface mesh. As you can see, this one's made up of tiny triangular elements. Next, we can convert that mesh to a volume mesh by converting those surface triangles into tetrahedral elements and filling the volume of the mesh with those. Then I import the mesh into special FEA software where we can allocate all the properties and conditions. After that, I use some other software to identify the locations of the mesh where the jaw muscles attach. And once I have those plates isolated, I can allocate muscle forces to them. Alrighty, so here's a model that's ready to go. The model is made up of about 1.4 million tetrahedra, and I've given them all the average properties of mammalian bone. Each of these green lines coming off these plates is a muscle vector running to the muscle insertion on the mandible. The amount of muscle force chosen to be applied might be based on muscle data taken from a dissection or obtained from other papers, or it might just be estimated from other closely related species. Just depends. I've restrained the nodes at the jaw joints and the biting teeth. So when I run the simulation to solve the model, the muscle forces will pull the skull downwards and it'll be held in place at these points. So this simulates a bilateral incisor bite. Once the model is solved, we can open up the results and obtain reaction forces from the restrained nodes, or maybe we want to visualize the distributions of stress or strain. Here you can see the regions of greater strain are more brightly colored, and this basically means these areas of the model bend more during the simulation. I can then magnify these behaviors and visualize them using an animation. Very nice. So what we then do is compare the stress, strain, or reaction forces with the models from other species that have been set up the same way. And the higher strain, or the more brightly colored skulls, will indicate that they bend more during biting. This is most often interpreted to mean that they would not be as good at the simulated biting action as the less brightly colored species because more bending of the skull bones means greater risk of injury. And there you have it. That's the basics of FEA on skulls. Catch you in the next video.